Good evening. This is Dr. John Bennett from Miami, uh, Larkin Hospital TV. Tonight, we have the pleasure of having Austin Walters. He's a, a healthcare innovator that spent a lot of time in the Far East and India. Uh, and I don't know the exact details of what Austin's been up to lately, because uh, I had, did have a conversation with him about a year ago, and he was uh, in Thailand. So uh, we don't have uh, Austin's video, but we'll, we'll make do with the conversations, because really, we're after what he thinks. <laughs> so anyways, good evening, Austin. Good evening. Thanks for having me. Sure. Now, Austin, why don't you just begin by telling a little bit about your background, the way you went to school. And you know what I really like to ask guests is uh, how they got into computers, because obviously you're internet savvy. Could you do that, please? Sure. So um, I went to Brigham Young University in Utah, undergraduate, um, studied international relations and um, Russian. And then I moved to Boston in 2009, and I did a couple years of consulting with a, a firm called InnoSight. And they specialize in disruptive innovation. They were co-founded by Clayton Christensen, who is the author of The Innovator's Prescription, um, which is a, a healthcare reform book uh, that a lot of the, the hospitalists and administrators would be familiar with. Um, and then I went to Harvard Business School, um, and then I took two years off uh, to research medical devices, um, largely from India, and I, and I publish about those on, on a research blog at globalhealth.care. Um, and I'm now back in, in Boston to finish um, Harvard Business School um, with a much uh, closer focus on um, medical device innovation. Um, and, and in a lot of cases, devices that have originated, um, at least in their design, uh, from emerging markets around the world. Okay, I, I've got your uh, website on the screen now instead of your face, so people can see that. Um, now, you've learned a lot, and in, 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 you spent most of your time in India when uh, you were overseas in the yep. last few years? Yes. Well, which city in India? Um, almost entirely in Bangalore. Okay, Bangalore. That's the computer center, correct? It is, yeah. It's kind of the Silicon Valley of India. Right, right. Yeah, I've talked to doctors over there. Um, India is pretty internet savvy. Yes. Um, they've got, uh, you know, nearly as, as high of a, of a smartphone saturation rate that as, as the West, and it may actually be higher by this point. There's a... Uh, you may be familiar with the term leapfrogging. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so there's definitely a leapfrog effect in in India with um, with internet enabled devices. Yeah. yeah. So you've you've kind of like uh, one thing that struck me about your website was the emerging market healthcare innovations that you kind of listed. Are you familiar with them at all? Uh, most of them, or oh yes, that you listed. Okay. If you don't mind. Uh, can we go through some of them? Because that, that's what really attracted me to talking to you because you kind of have boots on the ground knowledge of these things happening. Yes. And, and most of, I think, I don't, and I think most people don't realize the things that are being developed in a foreign country like India. So I have on the screen your innovation database in front of us. It's on the screen right now. Yep. Uh, novel One Bag. Do you know much about that? what that is? Yeah, so the the novel one bag is a um, it's a, a very low cost option for peritoneal dialysis. Okay, I heard about that. Yeah, and um, and and really, you know, these dialysis centers and machines that we utilize in the West are just too high cost and too centralized of a model to fit India, where um, transportation logistics are a big barrier and cost is an even bigger barrier. So, um, with this solution, it's a, it's a kind of, uh, uh, it's a self-administered therapy, um, using this device and it's peritoneal dialysis. Um, and, uh, it's, uh, yeah, much, much lower cost way to, to do that. Um, you, so you know, I did uh, hear about that. Uh, I think it was based in Bangalore. They were writing about some person who didn't have come down from the mountains. Uh, yeah. And, and people, I guess, like you said, they're, they're in the boondocks and they really can't afford to keep running to the cities for every dialysis treatment. 
Is that in, in widespread use or just in uh, pockets around Bangalore? Do you know? No, no. That I think that they're um, by this and, and Mitra Industries is not the only um, company in India providing the these um, lower cost bags. But but this is a good example of a kind of you know cost driven engineering um, that that I'm interested in with these devices. They kind of took a ground up. Uh, approach to redesign the thing and they came up with a very very much lower cost more rugged reliable solution uh -huh. uh, that that is a much better fit for peritoneal dialysis than what we have in in our country in many ways uh, there's just not a lot of innovation being done on um, PD in, in the US uh, because it's not not where our focus is okay the slit imager 2000 a $200 fundus camera yeah, so this is another another good example. If you look at um, some of the high end <clears throat> uh, providers of, of fundus cameras um, for ophthalmology, you've got uh, you know Zeiss and some of these these German um, lens makers. Uh, there are many many thousands of dollars to to buy one, <clears throat> and uh, slits as well. This is a device that actually attaches to a a specific camera model, and it can. Um, it can actually, uh, it's, it's non-dilation, so it doesn't require uh, pupil dilation, and you can get uh, pretty much all of the photographs that you need 90% of the time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there are instances where the highest-end devices provide benefit. It's just that those really aren't that common. Um, and so to force everyone to buy the, the expensive models uh, just in case, Again, mostly works in the U.S., not so much in India. So there's even better examples of this. Um, the, the disruption here has gone further. There's a, a scientist at Stanford, um, um, Asian-American scientist, who, who has in, created a $10 attachment to a smartphone mm -hmm. um, through which you can, you can take uh, fundus images that are good enough. Is, is this one uh, compatible with a smartphone? Still a slit imager? Or? No, this the slit imager is not. Um, I would say it's it's actually um, behind the curve on on this one. Okay. Um, now, one thing that looks fascinating is a swa swastila slate, a diagnostic device for thirty plus conditions. Yeah, this one is is quite interesting. Um, it, it's a, a professor out of Arizona, um, Indian uh, uh, American. I think came to the U.S. to do his Ph.D. in electrical engineering. Was teaching out of Arizona State. Um, a high-ranking political official in India convinced him to uh, move back to India and develop this this diagnostic device. Um, it's largely funded by the government, um, and what it is is it's it's just a tablet-sized device that has a lot of plug-in capabilities. So you can plug in a lot of extensions um, and, and peripheral devices into it and it will it will process their data, standardize them, and then it allows for the storage and transmission of that data. Mm -hmm. So you know when you add all that up you've got you've got the uh, point of care diagnostic ability um, you know for 30 plus conditions. So there's some biochemistry there. There's there's also uh, you know oximeters um, that are that are non-invasive. Um, you know different things like this. Uh, it, it's really taking advantage and trying to provide a platform, if you will, a kind of platform device for a lot of these already miniaturized um, sensors that that uh, you know measure different things about a body. It's just trying to integrate all of those into a single device. You, you know, Austin, I, you've got to get together with uh, you know Shiv Gaglani, uh, the the MD. The smartphone physical yeah yes you gotta get the other with him have you have you met him yet I haven't met him no but I've read about him in in Topol I think he and Topol uh, collaborated a bit on an on a, an illustration for a medical smartphone if I'm if I'm right yeah well he has uh, he started very early with a smartphone phone physical and as you know it's built more and more things onto it more and more devices add-ons accessories uh, and, and transmissions of, of various uh, sensor sensor uh, data. Uh, yeah, he's really at the top end of development of, of things like this. You guys got to get together. You're both medical device guys. Yeah. Well, I've, I'm writing his name down now. So. 
Well, I'm sure you'll run into them eventually. Um, let's see what else here. I don't, can't go through all of them. I'd like to, but I uh, don't want to take all your time up. And you just wrote about the remotion knee in your blog. Yeah, I, I did. Um, that that's a, a pretty amazing example. You know, the the if you look at the incumbent market, um, you know, a, a prosthetic knee, you got to replace it every four to five years. You're looking at uh, twenty thousand to fifty thousand um, dollars, depending on a person's insurance. Half of that may be out of pocket. Um, a lot of people, even in the U.S., for whom that's uh, quite a financial blow. So, um, you know, and in India, it's unimaginable. So Jaipur Foots, the organization that since the 70s has, has been creating $5 prosthetic feet. Mm -hmm. um, so with the help of DREV, uh, a prominent um, medical design firm in San Francisco, they've, they've now created this Remotion Knee, which is kind of a second generation to a, a prior model of a prosthetic knee they developed. It's uh, much better. And um, it seems to be, you know, perform very, very well. Um, and it's, you know, $80 uh, at retail. There's an organization called Enable. I don't know if you've heard of them. Yes, we uh, have. Yeah. Okay, they do the same thing for hands, uh, et cetera. Yeah, I think they, they utilize 3D printing, don't they? For yes, to 3D printing to make uh, low-cost prosthetic hands and fingers. Yeah, pretty exciting uh, trend. Great organization. And then one, one more which I found interesting, there's a lot of interesting, touch hemoglobin transcutaneous anemia meter. Mm -hmm. Do you know, Biosense, do you know anything about that one? So I'll say that the ones in green on the top of the list there are ones that I've written about. Oh, okay, okay. And, and the ones below I'm still researching. Um, I'm about to publish uh, the, the next one on the list, the Medtronic's um, pill-sized pacemaker. That's actually called the Micra... TPS, a transcatheter pacing, pacing system, and it's the, the size of a pill embedded internally for um, right atrial fibrillation. Um, amazing device, uh, but unfortunately, I, th I think they're probably going to charge more for it than the old pacemakers, but it, but it seems to have a lot of disruptive potential to me. Well, you know, there's, I ran into, uh, well, speaking of anemia, there's a, a chiropractor in Mumbai because I do a lot of interacting with doctors over there. Well, he's a chiropractor, actually, which, uh, you know, I don't know some people consider doctors or not. But anyways, he, he developed an app that's just in the Apple Store for detecting anemia non-invasively, just putting your finger on a sensor. Uh, and I don't know how reliable it is. I can't really vouch for its reliability and quality, but uh, uh, he's working on it. And if it could be accurate in a country like India, that would be tremendously helpful to non-invasively detect anemia with a smartphone <laughs> and, a, and a, an app. So yeah, there are a lot of exciting things happening out there. It's, it's really hard to keep track of it. So, you know, you're kind of the interface between the, uh, uh, the third world and the developed world as far as what devices can, can be brought to the developed world. Is that correct? Uh, I, that's, that's what I'm interested in really is, is how devices, developed for these other uh, market conditions, right? Where in, in a place like India, they've got a lot more cost pressure. Right. Um, you know, very small percentage of the population is gainfully covered by insurance um, in any meaningful way. And so they, you know, a lot of it's out of pocket. So it's actually a real market. Yeah. And, uh, you know, people are very price sensitive about things. So you see a lot of these products and there's a lot of engineering talent um, in India. And by the way, two of the devices on the list, actually several, um, are have been created through, you know, under the auspices of multinational corporations, but right. within, within their India offices. So Medtronic's pill-sized pacemaker came out of their, their work in India. Um, right. and, yes, trying to figure out a way to, to, to develop something less invasive, cheaper. Um, uh, G General Electric's, um, they've got a, a, a miniaturized cat uh, and pet scanning machine um, that costs, uh, I think, like three quarters of a traditional model. And far more disruptively is their handheld ultrasound device, V-Scan. Yeah. They developed seven years ago out of GE Healthcare India. Right. So, well, that, that's where it came from. That It came from India. Wow. So, so what's so fascinating is that the 
that market and its constraints uh, feed into the very engineering of new devices. Right. And so it that market produces a very disruptive devices. And I think that a lot of those can actually start to feed, you know, leap back up the pyramid into Western healthcare markets, just as you're seeing the, the V-Scan device start to do. Well, you know, I think a parallel situation exists in stem cells and 3D because of, because of the, not, not the lack of regulatory oversight, but it's easier to test for, uh, to do stem cell research and stem cell experimentation in Korea. And in China, it's much easier to experiment with 3D uh, in, in, on uh, 3D developments on humans because there's not so much regulation as the United States. Whereas, you know, there's so much super regulation of many things and it takes many years for any of these devices to get to be used by patients. Mm -hmm. Right? It's the same thing that, uh, that you're, you're watching a lot of devices that maybe wouldn't be would have to go through FDA scrutiny. Is that true or no? Yes, uh, you know, and a lot of these that have potential to to uh, reverse their way back to to into the U.S. at least um, are class one or class two medical devices. You're not seeing a ton of innovation yet in the class three medical devices um, from India, but I think there'll be more and more of that in the future. And um, so, you know, it's a less rigorous FDA approval process for class one and class two devices. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that's a, that is a big barrier um, for a lot of, of, of entrepreneurs thinking of, of commercializing in the U.S. is just the added cost from the regulatory um, um, pressures and then the reimbursement system and, and other factors. So it's, it's a, difficult, a difficult problem. Um, but uh, but I think we're starting to see it in a number of ways. Yeah. Well, you know, you know, I, my my thing is basically doing hangouts with people around the world. But one of the things I find fa uh, tremendously exciting is is the potential to interact with scientists in, in both Korea and China, which of course they have the Google re restriction, but you can Skype um, with with the things that they're doing. It's kind of see what what's going to happen eventually here. <laughs> Uh, with both stem cell and 3D printing. Um, and th this platform allows us to do that. We don't have to read it about, about it in a magazine six months from now. We can, we can see late-breaking developments. So hopefully, uh, hopefully, Austin will be able to get the scientists uh, on the screen and talk about it. But, of course, you know, there's a restriction, and I'm sure you know about it, with researchers. But I think there's less restrictions over there. In the U.S., I don't know, do you find, that's another question for you, I guess. Do you find uh, talking to researchers is easier over there than here? Because you know there's the privacy concerns and the funding concerns, funding concerns of researchers in this country. Does that exist also in India? Do they have to kind of keep quiet about what they're doing? Oh, uh, in terms of intellectual property uh, protection? What, what devices they're working on, what they're doing, essentially. Mm. Uh, you know, where they're going with something. Do you find a lot, a lot of that? They, well, my boss told me not to talk about it. I can't talk about it because we're going for funding. Yeah, I think I think that you um, you see a lot of that in India, definitely, because there there isn't the same kind of IP uh, IP law, and yeah. that the and so it's it's a bit of a wild west when it comes to innovation and the sharing of ideas. Um, you know, it's 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 kind of a, a leaky intellectual landscape. Um, if you will, where it, it doesn't necessarily take long for a new technology that's introduced by one company to then get picked up by a lot of, of, of innovators that, that can reverse engineer it and, and start to build their own, their own things. Or scientists or researchers that leave the multinational corporation um, like Medtronic, GE, or Philips based in Mumbai and then go and start their own company uh, doing doing the same thing, and that happens in the West as well. But um, you know, the, the the free the flow of ideas, I think, is is a bit more free in India probably, just because there's not that basis of of IP law. They're not the enforce to the same level of enforcement. So your work now is kind of suspended. Now you're in school, or are you kind of doing it part time? 
Oh, still pushing it forward. School doesn't start until next month, so um, I'm still publishing um, articles, and I'll continue to do that um, in the coming years. Okay, well, I'd I love to get you on a hangout with Shiv. Shiv Gagin. Yeah, well, I, would, I would definitely welcome that opportunity. Well, I'm going to approach him because one of, one of the members of my team works with him. Uh, but he's like you, he's a super busy guy. But you never know. I'm sure if we, when he sees your profile, he'd be interested in your work with – I mean, one thing I find fascinating, fascinating is being in another country working with devices and how they develop and, you know, seeing like, you'd like the perineal dialysis uh, – you know th that type of technology i think uh he'll find fascinating too so i won't keep you too long um uh, thank you very much and uh, hopefully we'll we'll do more of these and uh, anyone you want to reach out to to engage on the screen like shiv let me know and i'll try to get him on the screen with you wonderful well i i, I do appreciate the intro to shiv and i i hope that happens john it's been great to talk with you okay and, and i'll talk with you later but anyone else you, know, you want to know about uh, or get on the screen with just let me know Great. Well, hold on. Thanks. Thank you very much. I'm just going to wrap it up.